believe this is our sixth meeting if we count our organizational meeting. We, we want to begin our meeting today by thanking uh, David Cheeseboro for having us uh, here at COSI, certainly one of our foremost educational institutions. It educates all us like a beacon. We're all drawn to it. Uh, we even have some technology that I think David or someone is going to explain to us so that we'll know. Oh, 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 all right. So Eric is going to explain to us so that we'll know how to use the uh, audio system uh, uh, today. We have a great deal of business to take care of on some very important topics, so I'm not going to delay. I'm going to first uh, turn it over to our executive director. We're going to, we're going to go with David first. David? Is this working? Yeah, there we go. It's working. Okay, well. And, and David is going to introduce Tom Ryland from WOSU. Will do. Will do. Welcome, Tom. What I can tell is if you push that big button in the middle, it turns it on. So, uh, <laughs> but I want to welcome you here and uh, uh, recognize that in my 40 plus <laughs> years as a professional educator, um, it's, there's a lot of same and a lot of different. And that time doesn't include uh, the early years in inner city Huff when I was tutoring math. And so, you know, we've got a situation where a lot of things are the same. The challenges that the kids and those families face every day, the challenges of, uh, of teachers in the inner city. But some things are changed different. Um, by that, I mean you have places like COSI now. We really have a learning ecosystem that we didn't have when I started those early days in, in education. And just to give you one point of reference, and that's why I'm glad to see Pat and other organizations here, COSI served a quarter million children and their caregivers under the age of six last year. A quarter million learning engagements under six. We served and engaged with 400,000 teachers and students. So just as one hub in that learning system. But we've had to go at it differently. And we've had to go at it differently by embedding partners within us, whether it be WOSU, whether it be uh, OSU Labs, whether it be the, uh, the incubation of the Battelle STEM network in offices here, uh, research labs. So I'm hoping that one, as an educator who cares about our kids, that you folks are, are able to be inspired uh, in your conversations and in the input that you really come up with thinking about how we go about these differently. I think we've also got players around the table, players in the community like COSI are willing to step up and help. And, uh, and again, one of those unique capacities here at COSI is the WSU studios built in and one and only in the country. So I want to introduce Tom Ryland. see if this works. All right. There you go. It works. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Ryland, General Manager of WSU Public Media. Welcome on this uh, very important mission that you have. Um, this is our, our primary TV production studios at WSU. This is where we produce uh, programming like Columbus Neighborhoods, a documentary series we did about the history of Columbus and will continue <laughs> the next three years. Uh, Columbus on the Record, a weekly public affairs show. And I wanted to mention In the Know, which you, you may be familiar with, the quiz show, high, high school quiz show. It's been going on for 30 years out of, this, uh, out of WSU. And in those 30 years, we've granted over $500,000 of scholarships to the students involved in In the Know. So we're very proud of that. Uh, we're also proud of the space that David mentioned, uh, very unique in the country. And it's not only a, a broadcast space, but it's really a public square. It's where we talk about uh, major issues facing the community. It might be uh, refugee issues. It might be uh, high school dropout rates, where we had forums here for that, uh, poverty in the community. And uh, we're very proud of that. Um, it's all about connecting to community, about inspiring the community. And um, we hope you're inspired today. Uh, you have very important work, and we thank you for that. And welcome to WSU at COSI. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to now hear from our executive director, but before that, uh, I just wanted to mention that our third co-chair, Ms. Rancier, uh, will not be with us uh, today. Um, she sends her uh, good, good cheers. Um, she, as, as many of you know, she had uh, a minor procedure that was done and that worked out beautifully for her. She's convalescing and uh, she will not be with us today.
There we go. OK. Uh, thank you. Let me, before I begin my, my normal uh, 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 overview for us this morning, uh, let me just uh, make a couple quick notes. Uh, one is uh, Judge Marbley introduced you to the technology that's in front of you. Uh, so let me do my best uh, to explain how it works. And if not, Luke Nutter will, uh, will help me. Um, so the, uh, when you push your button, uh, if no one else is speaking, you will be able to speak. So let me ask uh, Mabel Freeman to push, to push your button. Uh, and, uh, and you would be able to speak. And then a second member uh, of the commission uh, can also push their button. Let me ask uh, Don Tyler Lee to push her button. But if a third member of the commission, Pat Lazinski, now wants to get into the conversation and he pushes his button, he can, only two at a time can speak. So he now has a blinking green light, uh, which will indicate to all, including our chairs, that. Um, that this is the next in line uh, after the, uh, the individuals who are already uh, on, uh, uh, on the, uh, no, keep yours on, I gotta keep, you got to keep yours on. And then if Ms. Langenhop wants, oh, I'm sorry, we, you all have to keep yours on to, to, to make this demonstration work. You still on, Dawn? It went off. Okay, Dawn, Mabel. All right, now you're blinking. Are you blinking, Pat? No? Oh, we got to start again. Okay, all right. Everybody off. Everybody off. All right, Mabel, turn yours on. Don Tyler Lee turns her on. Now Pat. Now Pat's blinking. All right, now if Ms. Langenhop wants to get in, hers is solid green. All right, now Mabel, take yours off. Now uh, uh, Pat is now able to speak, and now uh, Ms. Langenhop is blinking. Everybody with me? Um, and that if somebody else signs in, they'll be solid. Pardon me? Is there an 11 year old in the house to help? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. The point is that, uh, that if you wish to speak or ask a question at any time, go ahead and press your button uh, and you'll be in a queue. If people are ahead of you, you'll be in a queue. That way we'll always know who wishes to speak next. Okay? That's the, uh, that's the lesson for this morning. Thank you to uh, WSU for this advanced, uh, advanced technology that is assisting us in our, in our meeting this morning. Uh, I also want to mention again uh, one other thing that I did not get on the, on the slides that you're about to see is um, uh, at the last meeting, uh, we had, I had two requests from the commission uh, to the staff that uh, came up during our open discussion. One was that we finalize the dates for meetings in April so people can get them on their calendars. Um, and we have done so. We'll get this out to you uh, in your email as well. But let me just announce to you that the two meeting, we've scheduled two meetings in April. They are April 10 and April 26. April 10th and April 26th. Um, and let me say a further word about those two meetings, at least what our current intention is. Uh, I, I believe I've mentioned to you that we left April flexible because, of course, we know we'll, we need to begin after our next meeting to work on uh, recommendations, um, and we didn't know exactly what the timing of that uh, would need to be, how much time would be needed. Our, our thought for the April 10 meeting uh, is that uh, it will be a meeting at which we can come back to, return to issues that members of the commission feel uh, required additional in-depth discussion based on the issues that were uh, raised the first time we discussed that matter. Or if there's a topic we did not cover that a member of the commission feels that we should have covered, uh, we can prepare that. So that will be on April 10th. So the day is not currently banned. But we've given you a survey that's on your, pla that's on your place. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, we uh, respectfully ask the commission members fill out this survey dur anytime during the day today uh, and, and pass it in to Matt Smido uh, before the end of the day, before you leave. And this will give you a chance to say on each of the subjects we've covered, are there additional uh, matters <coughs> you want to return to or delve more deeply into? Or is there a new matter that you wish us to take up? Based on the response from the surveys, uh, we will then plan the meeting on April 10th. Uh, the meeting for April 26th, uh, we hope, uh, assuming all goes well, will be a meeting where we'll be able to discuss draft recommendations. So the, the, the staff, based on the discussion this afternoon of the discussion summaries that we're going to have this afternoon, and then on the April 10th, further, the, the chance to delve further into issues that you believe are still open or require further analysis. 
uh, based on those two uh, discussions, we will then prepare drafts of recommendations that the commission can discuss uh, on April 26th. Uh, and then, of course, we'll, we'll just simply follow the, the chair's lead uh, on April 26th as to whether a further meeting is needed after that. Um, and we can uh, then begin to look at May calendars if we need to, but as we recall, our goal was to try to be done by the, uh, by the end of April. So those dates, and that's what the purpose of the survey is, uh, and, uh, and that also is your explanation of the technology that is, uh, that is in front of you. With that, let me turn to our, uh, our, our regular uh, introductory material. Um, I uh, normally at this time, uh, what I do is review the highlights of what we've done up to, up to date. I'm not going to do that this morning because this afternoon's agenda includes a review of those discussion summaries, and therefore it would simply be repetitive of what we're going to do uh, this afternoon. However, uh, there are two developments that have been, that I think are, are directly relevant to the Commission's work since we last met. So I thought I'd rather use my time this morning to mention those two developments. The first is many of you had a chance to attend the Mayor's State of the City address, but many did not. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, truly his message uh, is, uh, uh, while aimed at the community at large, surely was aimed at us as a, uh, as a commission that he and President Ginther have charged. So I thought it might be appropriate that we begin this morning uh, by uh, taking a look at just a very brief segment of the Mayor's address. We are improving our economy by creating jobs. We are improving our neighborhoods by investing in them. We are improving the environment by getting green. But the most important thing we can do is to support our children by guaranteeing them a good education in Columbus. When our kids graduate from high school, they should be able to do one of four things. Get a good job, go to college, join the military, or start a business. But too many of our young people are not prepared to do any of the above. I do not fault them for their lack of skills and preparation when it is our responsibility to get them ready. As parents, as civic leaders, and as business leaders, we need to fight to give our kids the best education they can receive. This is the fight for the very soul of our city, as educating our kids is nothing less than the next civil rights movement of our time. <laughs> Education should not depend upon the color of your skin, the size of your parents' bank accounts, or the neighborhood in which you live. So obviously much more. The entire speech, of course, is on the city's website, if you wish to uh, review the entire speech, as is the text. Um, and uh, I commend it to everyone. I personally wasn't there, I wasn't there in person, but I have watched it and, uh, and, read, uh, and read the speech and frankly have been moved and inspired by it. And uh, it makes me redouble uh, our work on this, uh, on this effort. Uh, the, second, um, uh, the second subject that I thought we ought to uh, review of course, we had an entire session on measuring success. Um, and uh, you'll recall that we made reference to the state uh, standards, the state school report cards, uh, I, I should say district report cards. So um, in the last week, uh, the state issued the new state report cards district by district. Um, and it seemed to me that it's worth reviewing those report cards with the commission um, because frankly there have been some rather dramatic developments around the state as a result of those, uh, as a result of those uh, report cards and uh, I believe that it's important for the commission to understand those developments. Uh, to do that, I've asked Jeanette Oxender to review the report cards with us. Uh, Jeanette is a former chief of staff 
at the Ohio Department of Education, also former Ohio School Boards Association uh, executive. Uh, Jeanette uh, is one of the most respected uh, experts on state education policy. She has been a consultant to our commission, so as we've been putting together our readings and our materials, she's been assisting with that, also assisting with the summaries you're gonna see later today. So behind the scenes, she's been helping us. Um, but um, yeah, Jeanette was chief of staff and played a pivotal role in developing the state report cards and also in developing the laws regarding academic emergency, academic distress, which will be mentioned. So when you have Jeanette, you not only have an explanation of where we are today, but an expert who can answer any questions about how these, uh, how these information is derived and, uh, and what the uh, explanation for them is. So Jeanette. I also made her take a better picture. You should have seen the first picture she gave us. We, uh... He did, true story. She took it today, you can see, right? Look, look at the outfit, right? We, we snapped the picture this morning. This is it. <laughs> I was on the way out the door yesterday and got an email that they needed a headshot, so I handed my husband a camera and he took the picture. And I'll let you know that. Now, why don't you take this so that um, you, don't, okay, you don't have to stand still, okay? So anyway, to finish the story, I do not let my husband take pictures of the grandchildren. Is that good? Okay, great. Well, good morning. And as Eric mentioned, since the last time the commission met, the state has issued report cards for school buildings, districts, and <coughs> community schools. This year, the report card was delayed. They normally come out in August, but the delay was due to State Auditor Yost's investigation into statewide data reporting practices. The State Auditor has issued his report, and his office found that there was evidence that nine districts scrubbed their data. Scrubbing refers to um, removing student enrollment for unlawful reasons. Since that time, the State Auditor has forwarded the data on eight of those districts to the Ohio Department of, Ed of Education. They are conducting their own investigation to see if altering that data had any effect on the local report card. If, if so, if that's the case, the department is going to go back and recalculate the report cards and issue new ones. Of those eight schools where the data went to the Department of Education, Columbus is not part of that data set because the state auditor has not finished investigating Columbus City Schools data issues. So, Eric said we're gonna take a look at a report card. Let's start. You might ask why. Hmm. Okay, hang on, we got an issue here. Whatever, we'll, we'll deal with it. Um, the, the report card that I wanted to bring up first is the Cleveland Municipal School District report card, and you may wonder why. But Cleveland's designation this year is academic emergency. For a district to go into academic emergency, it's a two-prong test. The first is not meeting adequate yearly progress for four years, and the second is a grade of F, or basically academic emergency. Cleveland found itself in this position, and so did Lorraine City Schools. Both of them are subject to the state coming in to oversee how they operate the district and putting in place an academic distress commission. These, those were the two prongs to trigger an academic distress commission. What a commission is, is a group of five individuals that are named, three of them are appointed by the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, and two of them are district residents appointed by the local school board president. They are given the authority to come in and put in a whole improvement plan for the district. They have the ability to oversee the budget and spending. They can move administrators around, and in fact, they could hire a private entity to come in and run the district. 
So far, only one district, Youngstown, has ever been placed in academic distress. By law, the Department of Education has to notify districts if they meet these two-prong tests that they are eligible for an academic distress commission. They have, once they send out that notification, it triggers a 30-day period. And within that period, these board members that I mentioned have to be appointed and the commission has to start their work. Now, what's interesting is that we're not sure if the Department of Education is going to put Cleveland into, if they're going to put in place an academic distress commission there. I'd like to read for you, this is a press release that State Superintendent Michael Sawyer's released talking about the Cleveland situation. And it says, the Cleveland plan is an extraordinary step forward in getting the schools back on track and its potential impact will weigh heavily as the department and district discuss the next steps. The department is open to exploring alternative options in lieu of an academic distress commission to find the best way forward for the children of Cleveland. This is because Cleveland came up with a plan to improve their schools. The plan had the support of the mayor, the governor, the legislature, who enacted the plan in House Bill 525, and ultimately the public, who voted to support a 15 mil levy to implement the plan. So we have to wait and see. We don't know when the department's going to act. They haven't yet. They haven't triggered the 30 days. But because of Cleveland's plan, the district may just avoid having an academic distress commission put in place and giving up local control. Now I'd like to talk about Cleveland and Columbus and a comparison of the two. I want to look at the four parts that go into making up the district designation. You'll see the designation in the upper left-hand corners. There are six designations and they run from excellent with distinction down to academic emergency. Continuous improvement is in the mid-range. There are four higher and two lower. Three higher, two lower, yes. Okay, when we look at the various components, the first component of the report card is state indicators met. There are 26 state indicators, 24 of them are the state required assessments, and then you add in graduation rate and attendance. So Cleveland met zero of the 26. Columbus met four of the 26. And the four indicators that Columbus passed were 10th grade writing by 0.8%, 11th grade reading by 1.5%, 11th grade writing by 1.5%, and attendance by 1.4%. The next measure we use is called the performance index. And this is a weighted average that reflects student achievement for all students enrolled for the full academic year. If the data investigation finds that low performing students have been removed from this measure, we don't exactly know what will happen when their test scores are added back in, but we do know that the performance index will be lower. The State Department has said that any district who has their data recalibrated will have a lower rating. Columbus's performance index, Cleveland's is 75.4, and Columbus's is 80.5. The range scores for the continuous improvement label, which is the label Columbus now has, is 80 to 89.9. Adequate yearly progress is the third measure, and this is a federal measure that reflects progress of subgroups, minority students, students with disabilities, English language learners, and economically disadvantaged students. Cleveland did not meet this, nor did Columbus. And you'll recall that one of the prongs for going into academic distress, for having an academic distress commission put in place, is not meeting adequate yearly progress for four years. And Columbus did not meet it for four years, nor did Cleveland, nor did Lorraine. The last measure we've heard about before, this is value added. Value added measures student growth. A district either receives a check, meaning that their students receive one year's worth of growth, 
they get a plus that they exceeded one years of growth, or they get a minus that they were below. Cleveland was below, Columbus was below. Let's talk about value added more. Hi. So we absolutely need to look at the progress kids are making. The way you get to higher levels of achievement is to ratchet up progress year after year. And for kids who come in lower, the progress rate has to be higher. Now, how do we measure that? We measure it with this tool called Value Added. And one of the things I like about Value Added is this. Too often, the status of a teacher comes from the kids they teach. If I teach in an affluent suburban area, my status as a teacher is much different than the status I had as a teacher teaching in a poor river town where I grew up. Your status should never come from who you teach. Your status should come from what did you do with the kids you taught? And this gives us a glimpse, value added does, into what you did with groups of kids. Okay, and you'll recall that when Jim met with us, what he said, a student who experiences less than one year of growth is much further behind the next year and must experience more than one year of growth just to catch up. We need value added. It's important because 34% of Columbus's city school children aren't ready for kindergarten and need help to read. 40% of Columbus city school students are already behind by the third grade. To repeat, a student who, falls be who starts behind falls further behind. How much catching up will these students need? Last week, the state released a ranking of all schools in Ohio based upon their value-added performance. The good news is that Hilliard Schools is the number one district in the state for value-added performance. So, how did Columbus schools do? How much progress are those students making? Columbus City Schools ranked 824 out of 832. They were the lowest ranked in Franklin County among school districts and community schools. There are only two school districts in the state who ranked lower and those are Cleveland and Toledo. And there's Hilliard. You'll recall that when we discussed the win-win agreement that Columbus City Schools has with suburban school districts and that students living within Columbus City are often educated by suburban districts. So let's see how those districts did. Here's the results. Five of the six districts are ranked in the top one-sixth statewide. Eric? Why don't you stay up here? Oh. I'm gonna have, you know, stay with me for a second so we can see if there's any questions. But I, I just wanted to, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to uh, conclude uh, this section by referring back to uh, continuing on this uh, notion of, uh, of, of the win-win agreements. Uh, this is, uh, you remember, we, we, we saw this map here. This is the map uh, of school districts in Franklin County. Um, and uh, this is just one little slice. Uh, so if you look at this, the gray, dark gray is the Columbus City School District. The red is the Hilliard District. And the blue is the uh, southwestern city school district. So we have areas of our community uh, where literally block by block uh, you're in a different school district depending on uh, which block you live. And frankly, having just heard the mayor's state of the city, um, I uh, thought that that was a relevant thing for us to look at. Because the fact is uh, that the neighborhood in which you live, almost block by block, as we see from this value added data, does directly matter. Uh, in terms of the quality of education you receive in Columbus today. Uh, let me just pause, uh, Mr. Chairman, and ask if, uh, as long as Jeanette's up here, if there's any questions that people might want to direct about the report card. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette.
Uh, so uh, very quickly, just a uh, couple of our other matters this morning. Uh, as you know, I'd like to review with you where we are in our community events. We've now had six public forums. Uh, over, six, over 350 people have attended those public forums. Uh, we, had, um, uh, a, uh, we, have one more, we have one more coming up, or another one coming up on Wednesday at East High School. Uh, and we invite you to please uh, join us for those public forums. I think everyone who's been at them uh, finds them to be beneficial. Sorry? Thursday, thank you, I apologize. Nobody, nobody should listen to me on dates. I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna remember dates. Thursday this week. Last night we were at the Columbus Collegiate Academy. Even in bad weather, we had 50 some people turn out. Um, and of course, uh, we asked people at those, uh, at those meetings to give us their ideas. Do we have a video, Luke, of people? Do we, we have a, a, any videos we're showing? Okay, uh, you, uh, people, we, we're accumulating the videos. They're on the website. We'll show you some more in the future. Uh, we have uh, circulated postcards, as you know, 100,000 prepaid postcards have been circulated throughout the community. Uh, we have now received 1,500 of them back. And the, the first uh, session this afternoon will be a detailed report uh, on what we're hearing in those postcards, what we're hearing at the public meetings and at the public forums. Uh, also wanted to update you uh, on our website. We've had 7,600 7, visits to the website. Uh, the Twitter feed continues to be active, having reached over 250,000 accounts, um, and uh, generally speaking, days like today when we're meeting, the accounts are very active, um, and then they, it tapers off in between meetings, and then they get active again uh, for the meetings, and these are the number of individual impressions on the Twitter feeds that we've received. We have, uh, uh, we have toured uh, six schools so far. Uh, we have uh, two remaining. Uh, and uh, uh, again, I ask you to please RSVP for those tours because we provide a box lunch at the tours. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, the second piece of feedback, the first piece of feedback I received last, last meeting was to schedule the April meetings, which I've announced to you. The second piece, uh, Chair, uh, Commission Member uh, Pat Lazinski and others, frankly, have asked about visiting a school that is not, uh, that is what we call a priority school, not a, uh, not a high performing school. Uh, and we are working on, uh, on implementing that. Uh, and uh, so stay tuned for, uh, for uh, dates for that. Uh, I, I, the way my thought process has been since we have that April 10th meeting now scheduled, try to schedule tours up till that April 10th meeting. So it'll likely be into the beginning of April when we do that, but we will have those, uh, that tour additionally uh, scheduled. Uh, we did have a tour just last week, uh, North Franklin Elementary, uh, as I mentioned, additional tours uh, to be announced. Thanks to, to the schools who've hosted us. And for those of you who came to North Franklin, thank you for doing that. I have to say, uh, all weekend, it was Friday, uh, and it was a great way to end the week, at the week. And all weekend, I kept thinking about it. And frankly, it brought tears to my eyes. These young children gave us a tour of the school, of the elementary school. And, uh, and it really, uh, uh, you, you've got to have a heart of stone to not have been uh, moved by what we saw at, uh, at North Franklin. Um, so today's agenda, very briefly, uh, is, uh, as we've, uh, 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 as you know, we're going to begin this morning. We're a few minutes late, but not too bad. We started a few minutes late. We'll catch up on time uh, with uh, the topic of health and wellness uh, and its impact on students' performance. I think it's important for us to remind ourselves uh, always of our charge, uh, which is this is about uh, the mayor has charged us to ask uh, not only what can the schools do better, but also what can the community do uh, to support uh, the educational uh, excellence of our children, uh, and, uh, and what can the city do. Uh, and certainly health and wellness uh, is in the category of, of issues that we know transcend the responsibility uh, of the schools, and, uh, and we're looking forward to that discussion. And we'll follow that after a brief break uh, with another topic that is similarly uh, uh, relevant to what can the entire community do to be supportive, and that's the role of arts and sports uh, in, uh, in schools and educational outcomes and in the community. Uh, we will have our, uh, our uh, small group discussions over lunch. We'll pick up our sandwiches. Um, and actually, we have to go to a little bit different part of the building, so we'll, you'll follow, we'll have staff uh, lead you to the rooms where the, uh, where the tables are, uh, and we'll certainly invite those who present this morning to join us at lunch if you want to continue your discussion with our experts this morning, including Jeanette will be there if you have any questions about uh, her presentation you've just seen. Um, and then this afternoon, 
Uh, we will, as I mentioned already, begin with a detailed report of our community outreach activities. We've now accumulated enough data uh, that, uh, that it seemed to be worthwhile uh, to report to you on it. Uh, you received a, a document uh, emailed to you yesterday, and there's a hard copy of it in your books today so that you can take it home with you and study it. But uh, our entire uh, public outreach team will be here um, and, uh, and not only report to you and, and pick out what they think are the highlights of what they've heard, uh, but also respond to any questions uh, that you have. They've done an excellent job. Um, and then uh, the last hour, uh, again, you received in the email and there's hard copies in front of you. Unlike uh, the volumes and tomes we've given you, this is pretty quick reading. So I urge you to take a look at it if you, uh, if you have not yet done so. Uh, these are summaries of the discussions that we've had to date. You'll all recall that at the end of each discussion, we've been charged with creating a summary of the key facts and ideas um, that have occurred. We worked very hard, and I want to you know, thank Jeanette Oxender again and Mark Reel and others who, who helped us on this. The Patel for Kids team looked at it. The, um, the uh, ESC team looked at it to, uh, to, to be brief, uh, to be uh, informative, uh, and, uh, and objective and straightforward as to what we thought the key points that were made were. Um, and our objective in this conversation this afternoon will be to hear from you. Uh, is there anything on there that you think we have uh, not accurately stated? Is there anything missing that you think is critical? Uh, because these will then be the, uh, the raw materials that we use when we sit down to begin to draft uh, uh, proposed recommendations uh, for the Commission's consideration. So it's important to us uh, on staff that we get this right. Uh, and so we urge you to uh, participate in that conversation as fully as you can. So that's our agenda for the day. As the judge mentioned, we have a full agenda and a lot to do. Um, and uh, with that, uh, Your Honor, I turn it back to you. Thank you very much for uh, that update and framing our discussion for today and putting everything in context. We're going to begin with our health and wellness um, segment. Um, we have Dr. Robert Murray uh, come up. Uh, and he's going to be joined uh, ultimately by our member Elizabeth Martinez and our member Abdul Muhammad. Mr. Murray. I want to uh, thank Dr. Murray for coming. He is here with us from the Department of Human Nutrition, College of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University. So I know that uh, our crown jewel will be real represented uh, today, Dr. Murray. You please proceed. Thank you. Well, I know uh, previously you were addressed by uh, Dr. Kelly Kelleher, and he talked a little bit about health and uh, the child in school. I want to talk about a little bit different spin. This is a national conversation that has started uh, in the past year, where a number of groups are looking back at the data that they have that a healthy child, uh, an optimally healthy child, performs better in school. And we've said that for a long time. I think everybody believes it. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that the science has become incredibly strong around that concept. And I wanted to present that so that everybody's on an equal plane in thinking about this so-called learning connection. I think the first thing, and I always remind people of this, we obsessively talk about weight in this country. We talk about obesity all the time. <coughs> and we talk about BMI, and we get numbers and things. But kids are not just overweight. They're, they're overweight and undernourished and unfit. And the way the solution of that problem is not to get them skinny. It's to improve their diet quality and improve their daily physical activity and fitness. That's the road back. So we need to set our sights on what, where, where we can be most successful, and we need to measure our success by our incremental change toward those two things. This is what the, uh, what the literature is starting to show. One of the things we know is that the child's brain is in constant development all the way through adolescence into young adulthood. And that the experiences of that child, uh, both their physical experiences and their mental experiences, 
shape not only their brain function, their thinking, but it shapes the actual structure, size, and connectivity of the brain through a number of different things in terms of blood flow and number of synaptic connections and, and uh, the complexity of the way that the child uh, thinks. We also now have evidence, and this is what we're talking about in the learning connection, that the child's health, their physical activity, their fitness level, the quality of their nutrition, their emotional support, their peer interactions, and just the quantity of free play that they have, have an effect on cognitive processing. I find the data really interesting, so I want to just talk a little bit about it today. There's some things we can't do about cognitive processing. You can't raise a child's IQ in and of itself. You can't do anything with the genetics or necessarily with the socioeconomic uh, demographic situation that they find themselves in. But on the bottom two circles, we have a lot of accumulating evidence that we can affect those things. If you look on the, on the uh, right side, on the internal environment, I, I know Mark Real just mentioned uh, at the Columbus Metropolitan Club a book called How Children Succeed. It's, it's a, an accumulation of literature that the uh, kind of the socio-ecological environment can be changed to make a child more resilient, more adaptable, better able to cope, and better able to uh, think in terms of their experiences, despite sometimes those experiences being negative. The second set of literature we've got is that quality diet, daily activity, and level of fitness directly impact cognitive performance. And this is very important for what you're talking about here. How do we make a child an optimal learner? And these are two things, their resiliency and their sense of support and their sense of physical wellness that we can directly affect. And I think we've got good tools to do it. So first of all, we have the science, and let's look at that. The brain structure changes with development, and so this is obviously critically important. It's most important preschool, interestingly enough, as the brain uh, has its greatest growth. But all the way through school and the teenage years, the way that the brain functions, its structure, its size, its interconnectivity are constantly changing. This is one of the reasons we, we should not be trying children as adults, when they commit some transgression, they simply are not done growing. They don't have that abstract thought that we uh, gain as a young adult uh, over time. There are two areas of the brain, and I don't want to get too deep into neuroscience here, but there's two areas of the brain that are critically important for a learner in school. The brain is set up uh, in a couple of different parts, but you, you have this the so-called basal area in the back and the lowest part, that's, that's where autonomic function, that's your breathing and, and things. So it's the most crude part of the brain. But layered over that is the limbic system. And the limbic system is our effective memory store, and it's directly connected with emotions because emotions are one of the ways, the best ways that we learn long-term and hold memory. That limbic system has great positives for memory, but it has some negatives. Impulsivity, rage, uh, great emotional uh, outbursts all come from this limbic system. The thing that stops us from being ruled by the limbic system is the cortex in the front, the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex acts as a break because it directs executive function, abstract thought, reasoning, planning, using memory in a way that is constructive. So what we've learned in looking at children and their brain is how much these two interplay all the time. You need both of them, but you need them to both be functioning at optimal levels. This is executive function, prefrontal cortex right up in the front. Making plans, handling multiple things at once, God knows that's what adult life is all about. Discussing using past knowledge, able to reach back in memory and pull it out and use that information. Evaluating ideas, reflecting on work, making corrections, and controlling impulsivity. Very important. Impulsive behavior is a limbic function. And so the executive actually lays over that, that limbic area and controls it. When it's dysfunctional, when the child is not using executive function optimally, they have trouble planning projects. They have trouble with time management. 
They have trouble with sequential explanations, memorizing, retrieving information, initiating tax, uh, tasks, and retaining information. So I think it's really important that teachers recognize that one of the goals is, if I'm a teacher, what I want is a student in the chair who is attentive, who is well-fed, physically fit, ready to learn, and is using their executive function at full power, connected with their limbic function, that's where memory is, using that at full power to learn what I have to teach them. That isn't just about the time spent teaching, it's about how we use that time, really important. We've got the tools, and one of the tools we have is an understanding that the fitness level and the physical activity of the child during the school day has a lot to do with how they perform in the classroom. Unfortunately, what got us, all of us interested in this is that if you look over the last couple of decades, things like recess, physical activity, creative arts have been slowly eroding as everybody recognizes and acknowledges. The interesting thing is that it's being pushed out to make way for more time, more quantity of time on academic subjects. And yet, I think one of the things that's interesting is that when the, the literature is reviewed, there's no data that says that adding more and more academic time in the school day necessarily improves performance. What we do have evidence for that's mounting quickly is that as you take away these daily activity opportunities for the child, that they actually perform worse. And this is a very important concept there's a positive relation between the child's getting out free play, movement, creativity, and time away from academics in order to process academic information. Here's a, a simple study by uh, Craig Hillman from Illinois. And if you look at these two graphs, I'll just explain them to you. He's, he's looking at aerobic capacity of the child. They're measuring the aerobic capacity of a number of different students. On the left-hand side, uh, they have the uh, mathematical achievements on the right-hand side, reading achievements. And you can see the two areas of the brain we've been talking about. The limbic area is that kind of crescent-shaped inner part of the brain that does working memory. It encodes memory for us, tied with emotions. And then the prefrontal cortex, which does executive function and lays over it. And what he's been able to show with his studies of imaging, watching the brain change as the child thinks and does activities, is that children with a good aerobic capacity perform better than children without. It's not enough to raise their IQ or change their life, it's, but it's something very important to have a good learner at the table. Here it is for obese kids. Obese kids, interestingly enough, tend to have neuroimaging that's slightly sluggish, particularly in the executive function. It doesn't seem to light up as well as kids who are more active or uh, thin. And so they were looking at this, and what he's showing here, if you can see, I don't know if I have a pointer on this or not. What you can see is that these are images that are taken showing blood flow. And the dark, uh, the pinker it gets, essentially, the more the blood flow is. Well, this is an exercise in obese kids. And you can see in the back of the brain, the lower part of the picture, those are the things that involve balance, coordination, physical activity, um, motor skills and the like. But if you look in the front, particularly on the right one, you see the prefrontal cortex in the front turning deep pink, a sign of a lot of blood flow in the executive function with exercise. And this is the point that Hillman wanted to make uh, in his study is that this is the kind of thing that indicates that the child is, is hyped up, attentive, ready to go, and has executive function uh, going full tilt. If you look at these three graphs, you know, you're looking at um, exercising, and in the uh, light bars, you're seeing uh, math achievement scores going up as the child becomes increasingly conditioned. What's important to realize is that this kid isn't becoming skinny. He's becoming increasingly conditioned. The things we're talking about are uh, 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 applicable to kids all across the board, irrespective of their weight. You get improvement. The one in the dark bars is executive function. And you can see, as the child became physically more fit, executive function was stronger and stronger and stronger. These are things that we can get for all our children uh, without too much difficulty. So we've got good data. I wish I could go into more. I've given you the wellness impact report. 
which is brand new, just got released on Monday, that talks about some of the science between these. And uh, uh, there's a ton of science. I wish I could spend the morning talking about it with you. Essentially, increased physical activity leads to improved classroom performance and, uh, and the ability of the child to actually uh, utilize their full IQ uh, in the service of learning. And we've got the opposite literature as well. As kids become increasingly sedentary, as their diet begins to erode over time, we find that their attendance records fall, their tardiness falls, their visits to the nurse fall, test scores fall, they simply can't pay attention very well. So how do we approach this thing? We've got an opportunity to deal with all kids in school, 55 million kids trapped in a box is the way I used to say. Uh, so we've got a great opportunity to look at some of these things in terms of their wellness. Uh, and we've got good tools. This is a finding that when we were researching uh, recess in the American Academy of Pediatrics, this was something that we found that was really interesting. For a child to have concentrated learning, the best way for them to process that learning was to give them a break, uh, a brief break between cognitive things. So it's not enough to switch from math to reading. It, you need to switch from math to a decompression time and then go on to the next subject. Some do this extremely well. We found Japanese schools where every 50 minutes of concentrated academic work, they spent 10 minutes on a break time for the child to optimize the child's cognitive processing because there's limits to how much you can cram into working memory and get it to work. And so this kind of a thing where, where we're not looking for more time, quantity time, but we're looking to use the time optimally, this is what's really important. So recess is one of the things we do that's built to be a break in the day. To see it disappear is probably counterproductive. That's what the literature is saying. You can Take away all these things, art and music and uh, other things, but you're probably going to lose in terms of cognitive processing. This is how the CDC defines recess, regularly scheduled periods in the day for unstructured physical activity and play. When I think of play, I think of play like music, art, theater, singing, things like that, along with free play, where children are allowed to interact with each other, and physical education, where they're learning uh, games and learning to play together. We've got great evidence on recess, and that's the report that I think we have that in your packet as well, a recess report. And it talks about not only the child's physical fitness from recess or physical activity, but their cognitive performance. And then one thing I want to talk about a little bit right now is their social and emotional performance. There's not many times anymore where kids get opportunities to play with each other and negotiate with each other and learn to work with a peer group without adult supervision and uh, structure. So one of the things we found when we looked at the social-emotional learning in recess is that kids are learning practice role-playing. They're learning to use that, that working memory. They have to build experiences but they're also learning negotiation, cooperation, sharing, problem solving. Those are all executive functions. You know, when I worked at Abbott, one of the things I was always impressed with this, they would interview different candidates, and it, it was not the degree on the paper or any of that that they were interested in. They were looking for this kind of a person, somebody who could have good team skills, who was a problem solver, who worked with others to overcome those things. That's the kind of worker that we wanted, and whether they were a master's or a PhD, didn't make a difference. If you think about school and structure, this really comes about in those exercise times, those free times and recess times, a very important set of learning. The other thing kids learn at this time is how to manage stress. That's really what the creative times and uh, things uh, give the kid, is this opportunity to decompress, control stress, coping skills, perseverance, that's that other box that we talked about, resiliency that goes into learning and cognitive performance. I love this quote, and I put it in here so that you could, you could see Joseph Lee in 1910. It's the supreme seriousness of play that gives it its educational importance. Play seen from the inside as the child sees it is the most important, serious thing in life. Play builds the child. It's the essential part of education. We forget, as we get older, 
that this is entirely true. The child uses all of their learning and put everything they've got into these creative playtimes, music, theater. This is the thing that really draws the child out, hook, line, and sinker. We wrote a, a policy statement on recess, and I, it's one of the saddest things in my life to see. We've got a number of these coming out of pediatric, out of the Academy of Pediatrics lately, where we have to remind teachers and parents and policymakers that kids need time to play. It's a sad thing to me. Uh, you know, this is important. This is the child's personal time. This is where they learn to develop their personality and work with other people. It should never be taken away particularly for punitive reasons. The kids who are being kept in for punitive reasons are the ones that need to go out. This is a sad thing, and I think it's important in terms of Columbus and Cleveland and other schools. Kids with the fewest minutes of recess are the ones who need it the most. And unfortunately, this is, uh, across the country, a sad thing. We, there's a lot of reasons for why this happens, but it shouldn't happen. So that's the physical activity piece. The other piece is that a quality diet makes a difference in cognitive performance as well. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the kids, despite a lot of effort that we've put into making sure that kids are not hungry and that they're able to uh, perform at their optimum, we just aren't there yet. Here's the problem with kids. You know, they're, they're not just overweight. We talked about this. They're, they're overweight, they're undernourished, and they're unfit. If you think of the old food pyramid, the entire top of that food pyramid, 40% of it, is going into snack foods and drinks. And the, most of this is occurring at home and out in the community. It is not a school problem. But the consequences of this are dire for the child in terms of malnourishment. The second thing that, to me that is amazing, uh, having grown up in the 60s, is to see all the discussion we had about hunger in America. And now we're 50, 60 years later, and still one in five kids is food insecure. They don't know day to day whether they're going to get enough to eat. So if you look at a room like this and you think one in five, a lot of people even in this room have experienced this. I recently saw Howie Long do a presentation and he talked about his life and it, it was so interesting to me because when Howie Long looked at the summer, he looked out at the summer, he saw it way differently than I did. I saw the summer as just a joyful time. Thank God I'm not in school. He looked at it and said, I just lost my best friend. I could get a meal every day, breakfast and lunch. I had stability. I had these things. And now I'm looking at three months where I don't know where the next meal is going to come from. Really a tough thing. And look, he's, he managed to get calories because look at how he long. The other thing I thought I'd mention to you is that there's a, a documentary being released this week um, called A Place at the Table about food insecurity in America. It looks fascinating. I wanted to tell you about a trailer. There's a little girl in this trailer. They're interviewing her. She was describing what it was like to be hungry in the classroom. Her teacher had noticed she was distracted. And she said when she sat there, she, she would sometimes hallucinate that her teacher was a giant banana. And I thought, man, almost impossible to learn if you think you're being taught by a giant banana. I, it's probably not going to work. We know it impacts mental health. We know it impacts development. It's a long-term problem. If the kid is chronically hungry or uh, consistently food insecure, that's going to have lifelong implications for the child. So we've built this. Since the 60s, we've built this tremendous network to try and put a floor under kids. Almost all of this is in or around school, after-school programming and stuff. But some of these we still are having trouble with, like summer meal program, think about it. Very few kids are experiencing uh, food being given to them in the summertime compared to during the year. Only 10% are getting those kind of foods. We know it makes a difference on their nutrition overall. If I'm trying to fix the problem of kids being undernourished, they got to eat breakfast. It just absolutely has to be there, or they show deficiencies of major, major players in there. But this is the problem. I've got all these kids eating lunch. I have 32 million kids eating lunch every day, but only 10 million of them are getting breakfast at school. They're eligible. The money's there. We've got the infrastructure. We just don't do the job. Uh, it makes a difference. If you, This was a report that was just released uh, in February. Kids were less hungry during school when they got breakfast at school. They were more attentive, fewer behavior problems, better math scores, better attendance, fewer trips to the nurse, if I'm a teacher, this is the kid I want. That's the kid I want in the chair. 
we've got a new way to deliver it. We got grab and go. In fact, the first time I saw this pilot is with uh, Children's Hunger Alliance was working with uh, the Rotary at Kent Elementary School, and they did this as a pilot uh, several years ago to see how it would work. And one teacher signed up, and then all of a sudden the next year, all of them signed up because that teacher reported such a tr dramatic change in their child's uh, attentiveness and performance in the classroom. We have good studies on the school lunch program, very powerful. It's been studied three times in the uh, school nutrition dietary assessment. It beats any other venue that's there, packed lunch, vended lunch, leaving school, anything. This is a nutritional powerhouse. Closer and closer to the dietary guidelines, this is uh, one of our best programs, dollar for dollar. But here's the problem. Kids eat less and less of school meals as they get older, and they start improvising on their own. Here's what males and females look like by the end of high school. And I point out a couple of things here. Males do better because they're eating more calories. They're eating more meat, they eat more grains, and they drink more milk. Females, on the other hand, by middle school, really begin to erode diet quality. And some of these have huge implications when they move into young adulthood to have babies, folate, zinc, iron. These are major, major impacts on the mother, on the pregnancy, and on the baby for, for the baby's health. So we've got the science, and we've got the tools. We're not using them optimally. We've got tools that work. Um, and we've got a process to put in place. And I just want to tell you really quickly the story here at Columbus uh, Public on how they have used the wellness committee structure to develop their uh, diet quality, to improve diet quality. And I've had the pleasure to be on their school health advisory committee for the last five years. A lot of good stuff has been done at Columbus that tends to be drowned out by other things. So I, I just want to talk about this a little bit. First of all, they used the CDC model and they looked broadly at health and nutrition across the whole school, not just at one or two things. Uh, and they included everyone at the table, community members, as well as uh, administrators, staff, school food service, school nurses, and the like. This was a project that actually got underway because of money given to them in a grant from uh, Osteopathic Heritage Foundation. They began to study seven schools. They began to look at the health of the kids. And the data that came back was alarming. They had diabetes rates that were going up quickly. They had kids that were overweight. 50% of the kids were overweight. Most of those kids were in the extreme obese category, greater than 99th percentile. And so they brought this information back to the superintendent. And the superintendent realized that the school was not only not helping the situation, they were probably hurting the situation. And so she asked the school nurses to put together the school health, health advisory system and they had the main school health advisory council for the district, and then had these subcommittees, all of them working on different aspects of health. Well, I'm going to talk about nutrition, a little bit about physical activity, but all of these committees have had tremendous impact on the district itself. But here's what the nutrition committee did. They sat down and they laid out a three-year plan, and they took this back to the, to the superintendent, said, this is how we would like to change nutrition. And <clears throat> she gave it her blessing and it moved forward. She not only gave it her blessing, but she pushed back on people that were the naysayers. And that's one of the problems in schools around the country. A lot of forces at work here, PTAs, cookie sales, all kinds of interesting things. What they did first was they cleared all sweetened drinks out of the schools, water only vending. She then began to lay down changes in the school meal programs to optimize those. And she began to look at vended foods, and then we began the process of looking at policies and so forth, such as uh, allergy policies, class parties, and other celebrations. For vending anything in the school, they use the SnackWise software system, which looks at the food label and assesses not only the things that aren't good, like fats and salts, but they look at the things that are, that are good, that you want, quality protein, zinc, vitamin C, iron, those kind of things, and try to get a score and based on that score, they laid out a three-year plan that you can see by the end of year three, no low-quality snack food items in the school at all, gone. And so they really used what was available to working with Cardinal uh, Vending Company to really remake all the foods that were vended. I loved it. There was some little kid that came up to, uh, uh, to uh, Gene Harris and, and said, when are we going to get the Doritos back? And Gene Harris said, 
Never. <laughs> the goal was to improve diet quality, and they have done that in a tremendous way. School Food Service has done a great job overhauling the, the meals in advance of the national uh, guidelines. We were well in advance of that. And we're working now on these things, such as concession sales, happy birthday parties, and other things in the schools to try and find a way to do this that's um, either non-food or is healthful, healthful food that contributes to nutritional quality. For physical activity and uh, physical education, a number of things have been put in place. Uh, we've started to really look at uh, the new PE standards for the state and how to apply them broadly. But we're looking at a whole lot of other things, a number of different Things have been done in schools around the country. They're simple and easy. One, one school, my favorite, did these walks at noon, and the teacher would take them out. They would have someone from the community come in and walk with them every day and talk about their job, talk about who they were, what their education had been, and how they did their job. So these little kids were able to ask questions of the adults in their community in a way that was interactive while they walked at noon. And this is what it looks like comprehensively. If you build around a quality physical education program, you can find areas to improve daily activity uh, in order to have the child uh, motivated. We'll hear today a little bit from the YMCA and others about physical activity in the after school programs and other opportunities in the community. Uh, but these kind of breaks in the day are important for cognitive processing. The last thing I'll point out is that <clears throat> even though I don't think we should be focusing on obesity as the primary target, Schools that have done this kind of comprehensive attack on the problem have been successful recently in lowering their BMI rates, Columbus being one of them. This has happened in smaller communities where it's fairly easy. If you've got four or five schools, it's not too hard to do. When you've got 55,000 students, really a challenge to do this. But New York, Philadelphia, LA, Columbus have shown about a 3 to 5% decrease in, and most impressive to me, it's among the younger kids. And they are currently in this country at the highest risk for gain. So they took a tra trajectory that was absolutely logarithmic, and they flattened it out and dropped it a little bit. This is, if this is sustained, this will be a very important uh, contribution to the health and a real visual uh, feedback on the fact that they have taken a comprehensive approach and really made it work for them. So I'll finish with this. This is something I think that's important for people to know. We can't, in the healthcare community and the people who are interested in kids, school nurses, dietitians, uh, the school food service, physical educators, we can't raise the kid's IQ. But if we're allowed, using the community's help, we can put a better student in the chair. And I think that is step one to optimizing our performance in school. Thank you. I think that's a lot of a lot of information. It's really informative. Um, if you could boil it down into you know a few things, it sounds like there's a great foundation that's already in place. But what could be done to really expand upon that and include the communities and families and just build upon that to improve overall child health? Yeah, I think Columbus Schools is way ahead of the curve for a um, a poor district with a lot of of kids in it and a lot of diversity to the school district. They've done an amazing job and I, I give a lot of credit to the leadership there. The most exciting thing to me, um, Chip, has been uh, osteopathic heritage came back to the school and we're having a conversation about how could we build a system of kind of health centers throughout the school where the, where the individual schools become kind of resource centers for families. So not just the child in the school and the parents, but their whole family could use the neighborhood effectively to get health information, screening, um, you know, better connection with, with uh, uh, the things that we have. One of the things that struck me, we've been working in Wineland Park recently, and one of the things that struck me is that we, we don't need new programs built from the ground. We got a lot of programs in this community that are doing great things. You'll hear a lot of stuff this afternoon and uh, about creative arts and things. We have a lot of programs. What we don't do well is coordinate those programs and get them to people at the neighborhood level. This is a neighborhood type of a thing. And I think the schools are in a unique position. They're right there in the neighborhood. Families can interact. How do we use them to improve the health of the whole neighborhood, not just the, not just the child in the school? That seems like a common theme that we've been hearing across the spectrum. 
of you know how do we make the neighborhood the schools the center of the neighborhood and coordinate all those efforts to bring uh, programs together um, are there any uh, ideas that you have as far as improving physical activity or any things like that that we're currently not doing today that we could well, unfortunately, you know, we were seeing some erosion. We're, we're going to do a survey in Columbus Public to find out, or Columbus City Schools, to find out how much recess has eroded. But I think the first thing is trying to convince the, the teachers, particularly, that it's in their best interest to make sure that these kids are regularly getting breaks in the day as far as activity. As far as nutrition's concerned, we should really go at breakfast. I think this is a national campaign. You're going to see Kellogg and some other groups starting to talk about breakfast, but um, it, it's on the list of things that helps prevent obesity. It helps treat obesity, as you may know. People who skip breakfast have a much higher risk, twice the risk of becoming overweight. We could do much better nutritionally if every single kid ate breakfast, but we also could do better in their performance. Breakfast has a unique... Um, impact on the child's cognitive ability to perform in school, particularly in the morning, and I think that's, you know, that's an easy win. We've got, we've got the money. USDA is giving grants to large school districts to institute breakfast. That's something I think we could do in Columbus very easily. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, the next part of our panel, I'd like to introduce um, a couple folks to come up here. Um, we're very fortunate sitting on this commission to have such content experts and uh, Dr. Murray, there's clearly, you know, it's, I like when you hear a presentation, it's very simple to understand, especially when you're talking about, you know, brain science and things like that. Um, but we've heard before through our school systems that we have over 80 some languages spoken. Um, so clearly, um, we have a, a multicultural school system that we're working with, and we've got some uh, folks here today to um, inform that discussion a little bit. I'd like to introduce uh, two commission members, uh, Elizabeth Martinez. Uh, with Big Brothers Big Sisters and I'd also like to introduce uh, Dr. Muhammad and he's with the Department of Education really to talk about two of our emerging communities the Somali community and the Hispanic and Latino community. I'd like them to take a few minutes kind of tell us about tell us about their background and um, kind of what brings them here how they came to Central Ohio and also spend a few minutes really talking about um, some of the key uh, facts about these communities specifically, what academic successes that they've experienced, and some of the barriers and challenges uh, that, as we see an increased number of um, English, non-English speaking uh, students coming into our school systems, what impact that has on our system. So, uh, Dr. Muhammad. The, mic the microphone will help, I'm sure. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> My name is Abdinur Mohammed, and I am with the Ohio Department of Education. Um, as you have that uh, information in front of you, I think we have uh, um, information uh, on your um, packets about uh, the presentations that we have for you, but we will give you a summary of um, uh, our presentations uh, this morning. Um, Chip, as you asked, I, I'm originally from Somalia. When I came uh, to this country uh, about 30 years ago, um, and I came uh, for the purpose of getting higher education uh, here in the United States, oftentimes we talk about how do we get um, students who study here in Ohio, um, higher education institutions, to stay and live um, in our communities. And I'm one of those that have decided to uh, remain here in Ohio. And I came to uh, Ohio University uh, to, to do my higher education and then uh, started working here in Ohio and have made uh, uh, living here uh, for the past uh, couple of decades. Um, <clears throat> do I have my... Okay. Could you, could you... The... The topic that I'll be uh, speaking to you about is the English language learners um, uh, in the Columbus community as well as in Ohio. And when we say English language learners, we're talking about a um, huge uh, influx of uh, um, immigrants, refugees, uh, and other uh, communities who speak a language other than English who are in our communities and who are um, attending Ohio um, schools. And um, 
uh, the data that we show um, uh, would indicate uh, the work that's going on here in the Columbus Public Schools as well as um, uh, in Ohio in general. Um, these students include um, uh, Somali uh, students uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, as well as uh, uh, Hispanics, uh, as well as, uh, as, as Chip said, about 110 other uh, languages spoken uh, in, in Ohio in general. And uh, Columbus Public Schools, for example, there are over 80 uh, languages uh, that are spoken by the um, uh, immigrant uh, and, and, and uh, English language learner populations. If you look at um, the demographics of, of Columbus, uh, the foreign born population has been increasing for the past uh, a number of years. And, and the reason for that could be um, the quality of life here in uh, Central Ohio. Um, could be jobs that are available in Central Ohio. Uh, of course, uh, affordable housing for many of the immigrants uh, that come to this community, as well as a place that you can raise a family. So well, we're, we're grateful that people are coming to, Ohio, uh, to Columbus uh, for, for those reasons, and, uh, and we want to keep it that way. Um, when you look at the migration or, or, or movements of um, uh, immigrants and, and foreign-born populations in Ohio. And you look at the school districts, um, you'll find that Columbus has almost one-eighth of the immigrant populations in Ohio, one-eighth. Um, and when you compare Columbus to uh, Cleveland, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Toledo, and the large cities, you'll find that they don't even compare. And when you look at Central Ohio uh, as a region, Central Ohio gets more um, uh, populations of who speak a language other than English than any other uh, groups groups in uh, regions in 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 the in, in the country in the uh, state. So, when we say English language learners, uh, these include immigrants, refugees, as well as native-born citizens like the Amish and Puerto Ricans who speak languages other than English. Uh, many people think that um, uh, the Amish are not included here, but they speak a language called uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, when they come to schools, and uh, uh, they are included in, um, in, in our uh, numbers for English language learners. And some of Ohio's ELLs, or English language learners, come with backgrounds where their education was frequently interrupted because of civil war, for example, the case of Somalis, uh, uh, the case of uh, Burmese uh, from Burma or, or Myanmar, and Bhutanese, um, and other uh, unstable conditions. And these students need additional academic support in the classrooms. Um, Ohio's ELLs have more than doubled since the school year 2001-2002, uh, with Somali and Hispanic students being uh, at the top in both Columbus City Schools as well as statewide. Um, English language learners are expected to meet the same academic standards as native speakers um, in English. So uh, they have a, uh, a challenge of not all, only learning the language, but also competing academically with, with other students. Many of the English language learners lag behind academically due to language and cultural barriers. However, this gap gets reduced as ELLs learn English over time. And we say over time because it takes, uh, research says that it takes five to seven years, but up to five to seven years to become proficient in English. Uh, uh, even though we require uh, schools uh, through No Child Left Behind and through other laws, that within the first or second year, schools have to show evidence of uh, students making academic uh, progress of, of ELLs. English language learners, we know, and research bears that out, uh, need considerable time and support in attaining English language proficiency. The graph that you see there um, shows the gap in reading, uh, statewide reading uh, achievement for English language learners and native English speakers. 
And it's the challenge of the schools to close that gap in both reading as well as math. Uh, even though some of the um, ELLs come with proficiency in math, but the language of math is English, and the language of reading is English, and that creates a barrier for them in the first one or two years of their language proficiency. But once they learn the language, then that gap uh, gets closed. We also have uh, these students, uh, their parents, the parents of Ohio's ELL students, also have limited English proficiency issues, even though they are motivated to be involved in their children's education when made aware of the educational progress of their children and are communicated in a manner and language that they understand. One of the issues that uh, schools um, uh, work with, for example, in Columbus, is having the ability to communicate with the parents who speak over 80 languages and finding the right tools and the right supports to be able to communicate in writing uh, to all those parents about the academic progress of, of their children. Uh, we, are, we are trying to do a good job in Ohio in providing uh, translators, uh, vendors that can provide these this, um, services for schools. But it's a challenge uh, to be able to communicate and update parents about the progress of their children. As I said earlier, once proficient in English, the academic gap closes of these students. And we see uh, the data bears that out, that students are succeeding graduating from high schools, and are going into colleges and careers. But the barriers that they have basically are English language acquisition in their uh, uh, first years of schooling in, in Ohio. This uh, graph shows and compares students who have been able to learn English and become proficient, and the students who are currently learning the language, and they're differences in performance. And the gap that you see is English language acquisition between those who are learning and those who have already learned. Uh, and that is the, the, the difference that teachers are making to ma making sure that that gap is closed for English language learners so that they can participate in the academic instruction in classes. And this other graph in math also shows similarly the gap between learning English and currently in the progress to learn English, and, and we can see that. Uh, and we, we, we know that the students who become proficient in English are competing and, and, and achieving as uh, their uh, native in English speakers academically. Columbus Public Schools has an exemplary and nationally recognized ELL Welcome Center. I'm sure most of you are familiar, uh, but would need additional resources to meet the unique needs of these ELL populations. Of course, Columbus has one-eighth of the ELL populations in Ohio, and it has that much challenge to be able to help those students um, achieve not only learn the language, but also become uh, academically proficient. Now, variations in English proficiency levels, some students come at the basic level, and some come proficient uh, halfway intermediate, uh, variations in English proficiency levels, the academic background, where they were educated, how much education they had, and other variables need to be taken into consideration when determining the level of support ELLs need to become fully proficient in English. You hear a lot, a lot of times, um, how much would it take for an ELL to become proficient in English? And it's not an easy answer to give because there are a lot of variables that we're considering, whether a student is a refugee coming from um, a background where they have never been schooled and they are sitting in a ninth grade classroom, or whether they have been fully schooled in another language and need additional help in the language but have um, academic proficiency. English language learners in Ohio and in Columbus should not be considered a burden to our schools. Instead, they should be seen as enriching our classrooms. Um, uh, this is uh, noted by uh, Columbus school teachers as well as educators in Ohio that they see the value in having English language learners in our classroom, the contributions that they make, and once they become proficient, they are um, uh, succeeding 
uh, in, in our communities, and uh, we we look at them as a um, as a resource uh, enriching our classrooms. Uh, the schools of the future, if you would think uh, in the future, uh, will look more diverse, will be more diverse, and look more like Columbus than otherwise, and will need um, schools to prepare themselves in educating and having the right tools to prepare the um, future um, children. As a matter of fact, over 250 Ohio schools out of um, 750 educate English language learners throughout Ohio. And um, as, as communities move out into the suburbs and to uh, rural areas, uh, you will find English language learners throughout the state of Ohio. And uh, the diversity that they bring uh, 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 certainly helps uh, those schools. And when you look at the, vari the, the variety of language that these students have, and we've mentioned uh, over 110 languages uh, from Albanian to Zulu using the alphabet, but more languages in between, 110 languages of them, uh, Ohio should take advantage of these native language uh, uh, skills that these students bring. Uh, it, and it's an important resource for our for the global market because uh, this uh, uh, age in 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 in, in, in um, uh, our growth, uh, Ohio certainly needs uh, uh, the diversity of language that our students bring, and and we need to find ways to tap into those and make sure that not only our students speak uh, language such as Chinese and Persian and other national security uh, important languages but also um, uh, ensure that we have a labor force that is proficient uh, in the many languages. Um, the the, the um, conclusion of my presentation is that, that uh, Ohio is certainly uh, um, at a better position uh, to take advantage of um, uh, the diverse uh, communities that we have, and they bring uh, 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 and richness and, and, and value uh, to the quality of education uh, to, to our schools. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Martinez, and just to share a little history of how I arrived to the city of Columbus here, um, I'm actually on my third tour to the city of Columbus. Um, my family, I am originally, I, I was born in Puerto Rico. Um, my family traveled quite a bit back and forth um, to the U.S. And, and back to Puerto Rico. And on an occasion um, in my childhood, I had an opportunity to live here in the city of Columbus, went back to Puerto Rico, um, came here again um, for a number of years, and then returned and uh, returned uh, finally to Columbus as an adult um, and have obviously made um, this very welcoming city um, home for, for me and my family. Uh, Spanish is my first language. I grew up um, speaking both languages in my home, and when we resided in Puerto Rico, my uh, parents always spoke English at home, and I had the opportunity to attend bilingual schools in Puerto Rico to be able um, to retain uh, language proficiency um, in the English language. Wanted to spend a little bit of time sharing today um, from the context of the work that we have done um, through we've got Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and the Latino community um, to help um, shape and uh, guide the conversation about um, Latinos in our community. We started earlier talking about the charge that the mayor is giving us to examine the challenges and opportunities facing all children living in, in the Columbus City School District and certainly recognition of um, these populations, not only Latino and Somali population, but other English uh, language learners populations, I think is certainly relevant to this conversation of educational attainment. So what are some of the key facts of um, the central um, Ohio's emerging community? I think one of the key facts um, and I'll try to do my best to follow along here with the slides. However, um, we have been charged with another task, and that is uh, trying to get this through this information as soon as possible. So I will run through some of the slides and highlight those um, that I will um, be speaking about here. 
I think one of the key facts is just the demographic shift that has occurred in the nation as a result of the growth in the Latino population. So of the 308.7 million people that live in the U.S., 50.5 million of those are of Latino origin, representing 16% um, of the U.S. population. From the years 2000 to 2010, the, growth, the increase of the Latino population was 43% compared to 10% of the overall growth of uh, the population. We represent 16% um, of the population, and if current trends continue and projections for 2050 hold true, it is expected um, that the demographic profile of the youth of the U.S. will change dramatically um, by the uh, by year 2050, and increasing from um, a current 16% representation of the entire U.S. population to a 29% um, percent increase. Another key fact about um, the Latino community, students and families, is we are a very diverse community. And so when we tend to talk about Hispanic or Latinos, um, there's a tendency to group um, group the entire um, group together without noticing that there are some distinctions even within the culture of Hispanic and Latinos. We represent over 20 countries of origin um, as a group and a wide um, spectrum of immigration histories from folks that are arriving to the country um, here that are new to the country to those that have been here for multiple generations. Many of the students and their parents arrive here to the country, as um, Dr. Mohammed uh, mentioned earlier, for opportunities um, for better education for their student, as well as economic opportunities for, the, for those families. Um, and the parents uh, range, uh, their, their education and socioeconomic backgrounds range as well. The Latino community is a group of individuals um, that come from a rich, culture of strong core values, customs, and, and traditions. And, and I think it's worth noting as we talk about inclusion of this community to certainly um, note that there are a lot of uh, benefits and things that we can learn from this particular population that add value um, to context of all conversations that we're having. Many students, as Dr. Mahatma mentioned, and I will also um, reiterate that, that have received some formal education in their countries and are arriving here having um, performed well academically um, in their native countries and, and again are having challenges as they arrive here um, and are trying to um, learn a, a new language. We were asked a question about um, how students are, how uh, has academic performance improved among these students? And one of the things um, before I go to the slide that is on the screen here that I wanted to note is um, Kids Ohio was kind enough to um, pull some information together for us that is reflective of um, the Hispanic population and um, how they are performing. And I will note that commission members should have this report um, there at your chairs and wanted to just highlight and touch on a few points and, and we'll specifically address what is on the screen here. Um, but the district's total enrollment decreased um, over, over five school years. And while the total enrollment decreased from 7.6%, the Hispanic enrollment increased by 20.5%. Again, I think noting just the increase of the general national population obviously has also impacted and touched our, um, our local district here. A couple of things that I want to note on the second page is uh, the Franklin County enrollment. There's a chart there that talks about ethnicity and race, um, school years 2011-2012. You'll notice that um, Columbus City Schools is a third ranking where, with Southwestern and Whitehall being, um, having larger numbers of Hispanic students represented um, in their school districts. So, so the chart that we have up on the screen here that talks about the academic performance of Latino students in Columbus City Schools um, Hispanic students uh, scored higher than the district on the state rating test in grades four, fourth through six um, in 2011 and 2012. Um, they also, 
Hispanic students also scored higher than the district on whole math in grades three through six as well. So to the point to make here in, in the context of the question of how has academic performance approved among these students, I think um, is worth noting that um, it, it seems that Hispanic students are, are showing some, some gains and in some occasions are outperforming the district um, as a whole, on a whole number of indicators um, that we referenced here. And with significant growth happening um, in the community, uh, not only at the national level, but here at our local community, um, and that growth specifically happening over um, a little over the past decade, I think what we found not only with Columbus City School Districts, but districts across the nation, just having a challenge of being able to meet the needs, um, the cultural needs of all of their student um, constituency. But it's good to know that, that we are making um, progress in those areas. So the question about um, what are implications for school as we consider um, you know, the demographic sh shift and the continuation of um, new English language learner arrivals to our district, wanted to talk about um, some things related to um, considerations um, for, for the commission is we talked about English mastery being um, an important prerequisite for student success and, and wanted to say that again, even though Dr. Muhammad has mentioned that. I, I think you'll find that when we're talking about English language learners, and uh, Dr. Muhammad was speaking about the Somali community, but whether we're speaking about the Somali community, the Latino community, the Asian communities, we'll find that, that there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of information that uh, is transferable, a lot of best practices that districts are implementing that will um, be able to impact the entire English language learner community. I believe that um, there is strength in diversity, as Dr. Uh, Muhammad has mentioned. I think that diversity alone is not a strength. Um, I do believe that when we create um, you know, we build bridges of understanding um, about the communities and we're able to really leverage the talent of all of those that are in our schools in our community. We talked about um, the need for more bilingual and bicultural staff, um, and I also had a note to tout some of the work that the Columbus Global Academy is doing, which is the Welcome Center that um, Dr. Muhammad referenced, um, certainly an opportunity there in that space to have a concentrated effort of um, resources coming together to not only conduct outreach to the families, um, but provide intervention services to students and so taking consideration um, of doing that broadly across some of our other schools that have um, Latino students within their buildings. Someone who can really just understand the dynamics of what is going on in the home, um, the school and the community environment as well. And I think recruitment of and retention of a specialist in the schools as well. So on some occasions we will have um, one or two individuals in the building that, that are bilingual um, and are able to communicate with the families and understanding that, that the needs may be beyond um, just the ability for, for a couple of individuals to be able to support um, that particular population. And then the area of professional development and how to better engage our English language learners. Um, another note, another, um, did I move beyond this? So incorporating um, the Latino culture into the services and programs consciously and explicitly, um, what, I, what I mean by that point is um, we want to move beyond the recommendations to be, move beyond just translation of a document or having someone um, interpreting um, at a school building. And I think this is true. We found it um, specifically in our work in the nonprofit organization. And in um, spirit of transparency, I'll share a story about when we began our work locally um, trying to integrate um, with the Latino community, had a camp program that we own and operate in the Hocking Hills, and um, this precedes me, um, but we had a group of um, folks that took out a, a, a group, a cohort of Latino students down to camp, and um, from what I understand, and that was many, many years ago, is that um, it wasn't access as successful. One, we did have kids that were able to um, communicate with the staff. Um, they had very limited English abilities, and so there was a language barrier there. There were also barriers in families really um, kind of um, 
entrusting the organization of, of taking students away to Hocking Hills and how did they communicate with them to find out how the kids were doing. And so we certainly recognize that it was just beyond um, layering the work that we are doing um, and try to make the Latinos um, issues or, or needs fit, but rather um, having an opportunity to look at what the needs are and how could we um, best fit those needs. We've talked about this in um, several conversations, whether we're talking with um, school administration about, um, or, or those that have been doing great work in the community, uh, this notion of parental engagement being key. Um, and so parental, I, I have a note here that says, Latino parents care about their children's education, yet they do not become involved in their schools, and culture may indicate what it means for parents to be involved. And I think an, a partial explanation to that paradox may be the obstacles encountered by Latino parents. So language barrier, a lack of understanding, a lack of trust, the operation of the school, and in some instances, lack of education themselves. There's also um, research um, in the Latino community in, in looking at this issue of parental engagement and, and the challenge that it be, can, can become beyond just the language barrier is this notion that within the culture, um, the Latino culture, there's a high regard and respect for teachers and understanding um, that they are the experts. And so on some occasions, families may have resistance to one, questioning authority, two, um, understanding what their role is beyond um, just providing um, you know, introduction to moral and core values to their student, but what exactly is their role? And so a, a couple of things that I'm going to note here, um, one is just this whole notion of education, educating parents um, what the expectations are from the school district and how they truly can have a role in the success of their students' um, educational attainment. Um, there, there may be, as I mentioned, just reluctance to the to question the school authority. But I think the longer that they are exposed exposed to the culture um, and the expectations around their environment, we'll see that there is um, an increased level of engagement um, from from parents. I can I can tell you that um, aside from the work that I do at Big Brothers Big Sisters, I'm I'm also an interpreter, and on occasions I've had an opportunity to interpret in certain school buildings, and I will tell you, um, probably out of 60 um, interpreting sessions that I attend, 59, the very first question that Latino parents ask the teacher when they're posed the question, "Do you have any questions for us?" will be how is my student behaving? And so, um, you know, as, again, understanding their role is as long as, as long as there are no behavioral issues in their mind, um, they don't necessarily always understand that, they, that there are things behind that, beyond that. And so I think it's, again, to note um, the importance of educating our families and what the expectations are um, outside of the classroom. Generational and um, culture classes between parents' uh, traditional values and children's new, more American ways. Um, I, I will um, share just some, there, there's a study, a uh, research that was done following 15 students, uh, Latino students, that attended Yale. University and uh, examining some of the things that led them to their success, um, that track of success, of success entering into Yale. And one of the stories that sticks out to me from, from um, one of the students that had entered, and she was a freshman at Yale, she talked about this whole notion of her mother being um, pressured by her family members. Um, one, when she received notification that she had um, obtained uh, receipt or Yale had reached out and she had um, been accepted her mother was reluctant to send her away so culturally within the Latino community um, you know the majority of the students in in native countries commute to college and so this notion of sending someone um, you know across uh, states to attend and be far away from the family is not something that is embraced um, immediately from families. And so there were some barriers um, around that. And um, what was found through this research was that as a result of the educational system getting involved in a teacher um, 
serving as a mentor, having the ability to, um, you know, provide education to mom um, and encourage her to, that, that this was an okay thing to do, I think was very well received and was part of um, the reason why she, she pursued and um, has now graduated from Yale. So again, noting uh, parental engagement and education is important. The educating Latino families um, about the importance of early childhood. Uh, with one in four babies being born each year in the U.S. that are Latino, I think um, is without um, mentioning that that is of extreme importance there. And then uh, quickly, I'll just go through um, a couple of things. In your full report, you'll have some information on kind of um, some of the core values and strong family ties um, that exist within the Latino culture. But talking about um, the social emotional impact of those that are um, immigrating here to the country, I think understanding the problems youth are experiencing as a result of identity and self-esteem issues are important. Families are vulnerable um, because of the separations and economic insecurities um, that they've inherited through the migration process, um, the stresses of forging a new life um, here in the United States. And on occasion, these families um, can remain isolated um, from some time, so they don't necessarily seek out resources. Plus, there's this um, disconnect from the culture as well. So we talked about a, um, a culture that is deeply rooted in, in family ties, and, and if you are here in this country and don't have those ties, there could be this sense of loss. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience, um, when I arrived here um, on what would have been my third tour to Columbus, I did not have family members um, here. And so, you know, there was this entire period of time where um, it, it, I had strong connections to my family in other places, but being able to kind of find a unit and a family here in, in Columbus was extremely important um, to me. And language is not a barrier for me. And so you can imagine that if, if um, the language would have been a barrier, some of the complexities that would come along with that. Families um, may lack supportive network um, as a result of being here. So we'll see on occasion, and, and um, those that are represented the, the district here can probably attest to this as well, is we'll see students um, that are absent from school. And so impacting attendance um, because they are pulled away to interpret for par families, um, for parents or neighbors, um, and on occasions, you know, relatives or, or care for siblings. Um, so those are certainly considerations um, when working with a community. Assessing um, these needs and being able to provide some critical resources and intervention for the families. And then the importance of establishing strategic partnership with grassroots organizations, community organizations, faith-based communities, and, and businesses that have done work in the space of, of integrating the Latino community um, and have gained trust of the community um, and can help support some of the efforts of, of the educational community as well. And um, lastly, I will um, also talk about and, and don't mean to um, glaze over this topic because I know that is you know certainly a topic of, of interest and in, in both controversy as well is this whole, whole notion that we have um, an estimated 65,000 undocumented students in this country um, that are are born abroad um, they're not US citizens they're not legal residents but they graduate from our US um, high schools each year and um, in many of those students um, don't have um, opportunities um, to pursue further education um, and when they do there are certainly barriers um, in place for them and many of these students are graduating top of their classes um, many of these students are, are performing very well academically and so I think those are, are as I mentioned earlier considerations as we're having um, these conversations thank you um, I think we're probably past our scheduled time but in the effort of answering any questions that the commission may have if you have any questions for the panelists. Gonna, since we got started a little late, we're going to extend this out maybe five to seven more minutes. So I encourage any of you who have questions to, to ask. Carol, Ms. Perkins. Gone? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of our uh, panelists. 
Uh, your information has been very insightful um, and um, has given us a, a deeper understanding of the challenges that we, we have in education. Um, I'd, I'd like to begin first by stating that uh, the district and the Columbus Board of Education is committed to feeding all of our children. Uh, we know that um, if it wasn't for breakfast and lunch, some of our students wouldn't eat. Uh, we're particularly uh, concerned on snow days and weekends because we know that our students might not get uh, the meals that, that they need at home. Uh, we've also been very fortunate to have a, part, a community partner that uh, discreetly provides uh, um, backpacks with, for, uh, with food for some of those students that we've identified that we know might not get a nutritional meal on the weekend. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Murray. Um, do you have information in terms of how charter schools and non-public schools deal with providing um, meals for their students, and particularly those uh, that are in poverty? That's an excellent question, and I don't know. And I'm, I'm not sure it's easily tracked. A number of the schools participate uh, in their communities with the public schools and sometimes even get food from the public schools. They work out a, a financial arrangement when you look around the country. A number of other ones are independent, so you see not just charter schools but religious schools and other things, and they don't follow the USDA guidelines. And one of the points I want to make is when you look back from 1995 until 2012, um, school meals, both breakfast and lunch, have increasingly moved toward the dietary guidelines and they're really on the money now. The most recent changes were fantastic. A lot of schools, if they're not part of the public school system, they are not participating in that. And so I, my guess is that for cost reasons, they may not be functioning at the same nutritional level, but I, I don't have any good data on it. May want to address that question. Ms. Perkins, and um, we can have some input uh, from Mark Real as well, because I know that he can answer that question with respect to some of the charters. Mary Lou? Um, thank you. Uh, in fact, many of the charter schools these days are serving both lunch and breakfast in schools. It's not universal, but um, and, it, and it depends on the charter school. I would say those that are connected to the larger charter school systems more often are than some of the really independent startup. Uh, but we do work with charter schools as well as public schools, and we do know a number of them are. Um, I would also just quickly point out that there is some data in your uh, handouts about breakfast programs uh, across uh, urban centers in Ohio as well as across all schools in Franklin County. These are all public schools. We do not have charter schools in here. Um, good news, bad news. Good news is that uh, Columbus is the second among all Franklin County schools in the percent of students that are receiving breakfast. Bad news is that number is at 55%, which means still you know, um, almost 17,000 low-income students in the Columbus City Schools are not eating breakfast. So we got, you know, we've got a lot of progress that has been made, and we've got more progress that could be made. I do commend uh, the schools for the things they have done and for being number two here in Franklin County. I think that's an excellent record. Okay, and I'm going to ask Mark Real to uh, supplement it. I can also tell you that I know that the Kip School serves breakfast and lunch. The other uh, part to note is that uh, many public charter schools do not have gymnasiums or outdoor play space uh, because the codes are different. So, uh, but they, as Ms. Langehoff said, I'm supporting what she said. And just one more comment. Um, charter schools as well as um, uh, Christian religious schools are eligible for the same federal 
subsidized programs for low-income students as public schools are. Those programs are universal regardless of the type of schools. Before we go on to our next question, I wanted to take a moment. Uh, this is probably a good time since you have the floor, Carolyn, asking questions to introduce three of our uh, Columbus City School Board members who were kind enough to visit with us today. And School Board Vice President, Ms. Shauna Gibb. Shauna, you want to stand up so that everyone can see? Uh, Gary Baker. Mr. Baker. And Brian Stewart. So thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, in this important work. Any more questions? Uh, uh, Don, Ms. Tyler Lee. Thank you to the panelists for your great information. This conversation is very timely because coincidentally, as recently as last night, I was reviewing investment proposals to United Way around the topic of nutrition and fitness. So I'm wondering if there are any bodies of research that you can recommend that show the most effective ways to educate children about good nutrition and healthy choices um, that occur in out-of-school programs? That's a good question. A lot of things have been tried, and I think um, one of the best ways of doing nutrition is to, one, identify the fundamental messages that you're trying to get across. And I do think the dietary guidelines, I always refer people back there because the messages are fairly fundamental. You know, there are five key food groups and we should look for nutrient rich foods so that every calorie gives us something back. I mean, simple messages that kids can translate. I've seen them applied in a number of things. YMCA has done a f wonderful job of combining nutrition with that and after school programming and uh, you know, point of sale uh, things. We don't do enough with point of sale uh, of selling things. But um, the hard thing really is is getting the choices to be of higher quality. It's not taking away vended foods or, or snacks from kids, but to get people to pick a higher quality of things. And I, I think that's something that should be done everywhere in rec centers and churches and things. We, we stop doing uh, uh, treats all the time for birthdays and start thinking about, you know, how, how do we make that a little bit more nutritionally sound. Ms. Green? Just uh, again, back on breakfast, and maybe um, Dr. Murray or Mary Lou or Carol, if, if a Columbus City Schools, as an example, provides breakfast for all students or the, the ability for breakfast, what, is prevent, what are the barriers that only you know, less than 50% of the children are participating? Um, that's a good question, and it has to do oftentimes with um, how breakfast is made available to students. So um, universal eligibility is, in fact, a critical first step, so you take away any stigma that exists. But then things like, and, and Dr. Murray um, uh, indicated, grab-and-go breakfast is one of the types of opportunities that kids, as they get off the school bus, walk by the breakfast carts, pick up the nutritional uh, elements of the breakfast, and then walk to a centralized place. A lot of times in the best practice schools that's right in the classroom, where they can sit as, as attendance is taken and eat their breakfast in the classroom. What we find in schools that do that, you have a much quieter, calmer start to the day because students are sitting down and, and, and focusing on education. Teachers have time to walk around and maybe talk to students for a minute, and then, and then class can start. Every student then has had that nutritional start to the day, and it starts the educational day in a quality way. I'd like to speak to that issue um, as well. Um, elementary students arrive to the buildings around 8.45 or 9 o'clock. And, you know, little kids get up really early. You know, high school kids don't. So when they're up at 7 o'clock, they've grabbed something in the house already to eat. And so oftentimes their appetite has been killed by junk that they've already had uh, in their homes. And when they get to schools, then 
oftentimes, even if it's provided, they don't eat. So that, that's one of the issues. And that's what the, the teachers say in the building, that they just choose not to. Um, and so a lot of food ends up being left over at tables. You know, but they don't throw it away, but students have the opportunity to get it. But they're not hungry at that time. So because we start elementary school so late, you know, it's, they've been up for three hours already. But I did want to talk to, uh, make a comment, and I hope that the elementary teachers are listening to this. Um, it's about um, the number of minutes of instruction that we put on our elementary students, this 90-minute reading block. And what I'm hearing from Dr. Murray is that's probably not a good idea. They probably need a break sometime um, during that period. So we have all these kindergartners who are expected to be in their seats for 90 minutes and doing this reading and writing when they probably need um, art, music, phys ed, or something in between. And so what happens in the school building is there is no art, music, and phys ed until after that 90 minutes is done. And I know that our art teachers and phys ed teachers would be happy if they were able to provide services much early in the day. So I was really glad to hear that. Do you, and, and that's not uncommon in, in schools to have this 90 minute reading block do you know of school districts where they have actually said, okay, we're going to do 50 minutes, like you talked about in Japan, we're going to do 50 minutes and we're going to take a break with the kids? Um, the, the reasoning was for obesity, so it wasn't exactly for the cognitive performance, but um, a number of schools in um, New York picked up the Take 10, you know, the Take 10 uh, little philosophy where they, they take a break and they don't leave the classroom, but they do some movement, 10 minutes worth of movement, it might be dance or, you know, it could be something, but they're moving and they're not doing cognitive uh, skills. And I know that's been a, um, something that's kind of moved across the country over the last five, six years, and a lot of teachers like that. They see the kids sit down and they've you know, decompressed and they're now ready to be attentive. It is ironic to me that we all know in our workday world that we have to take breaks and we take them. But, you know, you've got a little kid sitting there they have to have the adults schedule them a break. Uh, you know, you can't just get up and go get a cup of coffee. So, you know, it's, it's a, we, we take breaks because we can feel it. You know, you're in front of the computer and you feel you've got to stop and go do something. But we really have to think in terms of what, how, what do we want from our kids and how do we get it optimally. I think it's really important. Uh, Ms. Augustine? Um, I, I don't know. I feel... I kind of want to piggyback on what Don was saying because I think that it's important to figure out how we can get nutritional information to our community because I don't think that it's because it's not taught at home. I don't even know if I believe that they're just they're not hungry um, because it's late. I think I believe that they're not hungry because they weren't taught that breakfast is important and it, it wasn't something that was happening in the home and so they're just used to their bodies are just used to not getting it um, and not getting um, the nutrition that they need so. Most of them are running around um, cellular starved because they're not getting the nutrition that they need, and they're just used to that. So um, I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how can we teach our communities that, and because I think it needs to start in the family. And then also, I, I also agree with the breaks because even in my home, I can't get anything about the school without starting with recess. It's it's very important to them, and I think it kind of bothers me a little bit because, um, especially in our elementary school. Why isn't learning fun? Why isn't it, you know, why is it that they're sitting there and it's the instruction um, is, is, is so, you know, let's sit still and pay attention and, and, and that they need that play break. But I think that it's important for us to figure out how can we add that into the curriculum where it is play also so it doesn't even feel like they're working. They're, they are playing the whole day while they're learning. I mean, and I know I might be, not be able to tell every teacher to do that. I wish I could, but um, I just I think that a lot of the things that, that we're talking about the, about today in regards to health and wellness, it begins in the community and it's something that needs to be taught because even our grocery stores are not providing, in particular communities aren't providing nutritious selections because that's not what's chosen. So how do we start there, I guess? You might not be able to answer that. But. <laughs> I think that's one, of the, that's one of the real challenges, particularly when you move away from the big stores and you're getting down into smaller stores know who are going to want to sell what sells and, uh, and it's a real challenge I know United Way has started to tackle that and look at neighborhood stores and how do they improve the quality the diet quality and at the same time educate people about why it's better you know dollar for dollar what they get from this versus something else um, but that that's a you know that whole thing about new 
nutrient richness where you're really looking for something from the food, not just sugar or sugar water, but you're really looking for something back from the food is, uh, is something that we have to really teach families from, from early age. I think that's, we're probably not going to win doing it at school age. We really need to start at birth and work our way through, and there's a lot of us who've been interested in that for a while. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Uh, Ms. Carson, then Ms. Hightower, then Ms. Tyson. And then we're going to take a break. <laughs> when we say half of Columbus children are not eating breakfast, have we surveyed them to determine that they're not eating breakfast at school, but maybe at home, or are we basing our estimation on the fact that they're not eating breakfast at school? Um, our data is simply based on eating breakfast at school, um, and what we're doing is comparing to other school districts and who are getting breakfast at school. What we can tell you from what a lot of national surveys say is it's, it's often not that they're getting breakfast at home. That's really not generally what the issue is. Now, you know, I, I think there is some of what uh, was stated of maybe grabbing something um, on the way to school, but that's, that's generally not what the national uh, research shows us. Okay, oops. <laughs> you know I'm loud already anyway. Um, Dr. Murray, um, I appreciate and um, I'm an advocate for um, health and wellness. But could you please not take the sugar out of the birthday cakes, please? You mentioned earlier. <laughs> Um, but, but anyway, I, I guess the, the point that I just really want to raise here today is that this issue that we're talking about as far as breakfast just doesn't apply to kids in public schools um, or just children. This is something that is a national piece. I mean, I, had to use, I used to have to force my son every morning um, to eat breakfast. That was a ritual in our home. Because that was a family piece for us. So I just want us to keep in mind that this doesn't just relate to kids in public schools or poor, school, or, or poor children. The children just don't eat breakfast, period, the end. Um, or they don't eat nutritional meals, period, the end. Um, my son is a senior in college and he eats Chipotle every day. Um, because he hates the nutritious meal that's that I pay for for his his package. So, so I guess what I would like to see is: Are we connecting any type of local or national initiatives to our school system as it relates to health and wellness and nutrition that could be maybe modeled so that it just doesn't look like it's something that's just the responsibility of the schools? That's, that's a great comment. You know, I, one of the things I always point out, I showed you the nutritional uh, debacle that is uh, kids leaving high school as far as their nutrients are concerned. One out of three teen girls don't eat breakfast at all, and the second one out of those three eats it only sporadically. I mean, that's, so it's not, it's not just because it's not available. It's just they don't, they don't do it. Um, and, and one of my friends who was a psychologist used to say, you could get a kid involved, any kid, teenager included, involved in any program you've got if it involves food or friends and fun. And that to me is what, that, that to me is the advantage of breakfast in the classroom is you've got kids together socially eating together. It's not just that there's not a stigma, it's a fun thing to do. And, and when, you, when you use that combination, you'll get people. Um, there are some programs, you know, uh, we just talked at the last school health advisory committee meeting for Columbus City Schools, we talked about Fuel Up to Play 60, which is a national set of programs the NFL puts on with the National Dairy Council, and it's a child idea for health and wellness within their school that they get an adult mentor either from outside the school or inside the school, and then they get these mini grants from the NFL and uh, National Dairy Council to try that idea out. Um, and I've seen some unbelievable transformations in school from eight-year-old kids who just had some idea to either promote breakfast or get a salad bar to do a, a walking club, I mean, little things, 
But from that little nidus, this crystal forms, and all of a sudden you have staff wellness and teachers are participating and stuff. So it, it doesn't have to be expensive, and I wanted to really stress that. We, we've got the tools and the programs, and they're not costly. We just need to really bring them to bear uh, on these kind of things. Last question from Ms. Tyson. Thank you. I don't really have a question, just really want to make a statement. First of all, thank you for all the presentations. I know that we spend a lot of time discussing um, the breakfast and the menu, which is quite important for a young person's health as well as adult health. But I also now want to just move to the presentation by Dr. Muhammad and Ms. Martinez. And just listening to the presentation today, just want to make sure that we realize that our community is changing. And um, they certainly have ex expressed some of the needs that um, their particular communities need, as well as understanding that if we have over a hundred different languages spoken within this community, with the uh, majority of the increases being from the Somali and the Hispanic community, and these are individuals who, and we're talking about Columbus being, of course, we are a global city. We just, most of us were at the event yesterday about it being a global city. And so we need to make sure that, um, that the issues that they have brought up, that we figure out a way to make sure that we are able to help to meet those needs, specifically around um, the English as a second language, and there not being, and right now, enough resources to be able to meet the needs of, of this community. And so to think about the nonprofits, how we can support the school system, because we need to make sure that, one, that individuals are speaking the English language, but also that we have individuals who are also being able to speak um, their languages. And so for so that all children are able to move forward and we utilize with this their all the the wonderful attributes that these communities bring to help us to be this global city that um, that we are saying that we are and want to continue to strive to be. So want to make sure that the proper funding is um, is given throughout this community to make sure that we can meet those needs. Thank you for that astute observation. I, I think that that concludes our questions. I want to thank the our panel for such a rich discussion. And we're going to stand in recess for about 10 minutes until 11.35. Move around. <laughs> Move around. <laughs>